Welcome to The Art of Growth. I'm Jim Zartman. And I'm Joel Hubbard. And we are talking about instincts today. Yes. Launching 2021 with a series on that subject. I don't know if you found this in your work with clients, Jim, the interest around instincts and why Mm. that seems to be so important and helpful to personal growth and development. Yeah, it's definitely mounting. And so people Mm. have been asking us to do some more stuff on the instincts. And I've felt like the last year we weren't quite ready to take it on. Like we had Beatrice Chestnut on, who's one of our favorite thinkers around this. Oh, amazing. If you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to that for sure. But we want to take it on because we do have a little bit of a different take on it. But also, we've been expanding so much in the way that we understand it. A lot of this has come out of the work with clients, which we always want to remind people the Enneagram is based on Mm self-reporting. So the best research we can do is having the conversation with clients. Yeah learning from them about what it's like to be them and to live in their skin. So, yes, this has been a a growing thing for us. And, yeah, we're leaning into it, yeah. And we're not looking to prove a theory. That's not our primary drive at all. Um, It's to take in the different theories that are out there. We've read them and interacted with them. But then in our own practice, what's emerging, what's coming up? And then eventually the better theories start to emerge naturally, right? So Well, you try different things on, and then what you find is there's certain things you always return to. Mm -hmm. And so over time you go, what is the thing I keep coming back to that seems to be the most consistently helpful? And so if we're going to bring things to people on a podcast, we want to say, well, this is the things we're finding consistently helpful. Yeah, yeah. So – Let's talk about instincts and yeah. what does that mean, Jim? What is the <laughs> does <laughs> where does mean? that come from? What's the uh, Yeah. I like the starting of the understanding around instincts to be placed in their natural setting, the evolutionary world. They are literally instinctual responses. They are something we often only see in the rearview mirror. It's almost like they're in that reptilian part of the brain primarily as far as their starting point, even though as we've gone forward and and evolved the other instincts, some of them require more cognitive function than others. But when you think about humans, our starting point is we are basically the world's greatest nest builders. (laughs) So we're funny. Like we see an animal that seems warm in the winter and we're like, well, I'm, I'm going to kill that and wear its skin because it seems warm. <laughs> um, that goose over there, that looks really warm. I think I think if I take all of its feathers and put them around mm-hmm. me, like I'll be warm and I'll be safe. And so almost immediately we, from an early stage, we are not just adapting to our environment, but adapting it to us. And these instincts are like evolutionary energies that came online, being, you know, that self-preservational, the sexual and the social. And then we'll go through all of those. But... I think of them first and foremost as very elemental, evolutionary, straight down to like instinctual, all the way through into the Mm -hmm. animalistic kingdom, the animal kingdom type of a drive. So Mm -hmm. that's like the first thing that comes to mind when I think of the instincts. Mm. What about you? Yeah. You know, when I first heard it, it made all the sense in the world as I watched all kinds of animal kingdom shows and, (laughs) you know, and sure, we've seen all of that, the self-preservational instinct of, you know... Mm. Squirreling away the nuts for the winter to, you know, the mating season uh, to even how groups work together like the wolf pack and and the brilliance of that. I mean, Mm. there's a genius to all of it. These are instincts that have kept species alive for millennia. So, um, yeah, the care of self, the connection to other and then the connection to the wider group, the The preservation of the immediate uh, animal in front of me, which is me, the need to perpetuate the species that is even willing to take risk in order to do so in the sexual energy uh, the, or the one-to-one, as we call it in when we work in corporate circles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or that social industry, that, that the energy of like wanting to make sure that the herd is okay and that we can actually have better chances at survival if we work together. Mm. So, yeah, from the very start, like that's the energy of those types. Yeah. Let's begin with the self-preservational instinct, where that emerges. And it's the first one that seems to come online for us as humans, right? From early on. Right. So they do evolve in an order from an evolutionary standpoint. It starts with self-pres, goes to sexual, then to social. So yeah, we're really talking about the starting point that is true for all humans, which is it's 
embedded in the survival instinct. And, you know, to say that there's stages, we can see that somewhat, but there's also this, all three are always functioning within us uh, Mm -hmm. as humans. There's never a time where there's no such thing as, like, I have zero of this other instinct. I say that sometimes because I feel like my (laughs) self-pres is the lowest. But it's actually not true. And the more I've looked at my own life, the more I see, oh, no, it shows up. And it shows up frequently. But it's a different reaction toward it, and we'll talk more about that in later episodes. But the self-preservational instinct has sort of three components or categories under that. Mm. The first one being health and well-being. Mm. The sense of being okay, being healthy, being well-fed. So this turns the attention towards, you know, the body. Like, yeah. how's my body doing? You know, I think about health as people who naturally think about what they eat or think about exercise and they they pick up quickly also on things like I'm not feeling so good. I think I need to rest. I feel like I'm coming down with something. And there are others who don't really pick up on that. They'll start even having a tickle in the throat and they ignore it and they move on. Whereas someone who is really oriented towards self-preservation in that category of health and well-being will focus on that almost immediately. Things like that come right to the surface for those types. Yes, they're very tuned in to what is going to help them survive. And of course, that is going to always start with their own body. That's always going to start with, do I have enough calories, the right calories? Can I avoid environments that could make me sick? Yeah. Can I avoid environments that could cause threat to my physical body? So I want to put my body in a safe and as healthy a environment as possible. And so, yeah, that I always think of the starting point for the self pres type. And people who say, like, I love my sleep, right? Yeah. It's really <laughs> yes, they're better protective. at sleepers. They're really good at They're really, yeah, it's like really protective yeah, of that. Yeah. And there's even an anxiety around it. Like, if you mm. think about self preservation, there's an extra anxiety around the protection of the self. Yeah. And so you'll notice that in people that are high self preservational types, is when it comes to things like, I didn't sleep enough. They get anxious around that. You know, why are we not home yet? Why are we not going to bed at the right time? Why are we eating this? Hmm. You know, I didn't go to the gym this week. And Hmm. there's a difference between that and we'll talk about the sexual energy next (laughs) in terms of the gym, which is fascinating to me because both oftentimes are really in the gym, but for very different reasons. You know, self-preservation is very much about like, how am I doing physically? And am I you know, taking care of my body and I can tune into that energy. I can feel when I've been working out. I feel much better. I feel more energy. This will protect me from, you know, from getting sick more easily. Um, So those are things that tend to come to mind for self-preservational types. Yeah, that's the first thing right off the bat. And because of that, there is that secondary thing that we talk about with just like resources and practical know-how. Self-pres types are really tuned into their resources. They're very aware of Do I have what I need to survive? These are tend to be people who are good at like a savings account and putting away for a rainy day. They they tend to also just have this capacity to generate income. Like there's a, a lot of attention. Once again, we talk about in the Enneagram where the attention goes, the energy follows. And the attention goes to do I have enough resources? Yeah. You'll find those people who really have this sort of resource management as their predominant category under that uh, self-preservational instinct, they will tend to be penny pinchers. It's just natural for them to think of, I'm not going to spend five more dollars for this $5,000 item. You know, like even a dollar, your self-preservational instinct just has this awareness of even the dollar, even the penny, and why that's important as opposed to, it's $5 or it's a penny or it's right. a dollar. Like, who cares? It's yeah. not a big deal. Other instincts would say that and self-preservational would not. They would take a look at that and it matters. And so they they tend yeah. to be really good with all the way down to the penny. And it's interesting. I don't feel like the self-pres types that I come across are – they have as much – interest in like luxury items or as fancy of a thing. Like I'm sure there's could be exceptions based on the, you know, the variation of the type and how things are in balance. But there seems to be kind of like, well, do I have what I need? And then do I have enough so that I know I'll have what I need later? Mm-hmm. And then that basically meets some of those needs. You know, that's a really good point. I think so many people I know who are self-preservational dominant instinct types, 
if friends of mine and yeah. even when they did get something nice, they got it for dirt cheap. They <laughs> found a way to both have the nice right. and a super chat. I'm like, how do you how do you have right. a nose for deals like that? And they just do. It seems like they have a genius around I know where to find stuff and I know where to get it, and I'm not going to spend a lot of money. In fact, I'm going to probably get a really good deal out of this. Yeah, I mean, they're probably going to spend more money on buying organic food, but they're probably not going to go for the Beamer. (laughs) That's right. That's right. (laughs) The management of the resources is like, okay, so I have the resource of, do we have enough food? Right. So is our fridge stocked? Do we have overflow in case of, you know, storm coming, in case of anything bad that could happen? Self-preservational instinct thinks that way. What could come around the corner, right? There could be a famine, you know, in the ancient world. It could be a storm, you know, catastrophe of some sort that comes and hits us. Are we prepared for that? Mm. And so it's very much about thinking in terms of preparation for something that could happen to have enough resources there. So it's shelter, it's food, it's money. And those are the things that those types think, think of. And possessions as well. So you can find people that have lots of different possessions in their home. Mm. And if they know where all of it is, or they at least know what tools they own or what resources they have in their home, they tend to be self-preservational. It is remarkable. I've joked about this with my brother. I don't think he'd mind this because it makes him look good and me look bad. (laughs) But he's he's a, uh, he's definitely self-preservational. And, you know, we used to work together occasionally early on in the days of, in our college days as plasters. And he always knew where his tools were. I never did. I always lost my tools, forgot where I put them. He never did, which is why his boss liked him more than me is because my brother always was prepared, always had everything he needed. And his tools were always maintained well and clean, like really clean. And so I always envied that. Like, how do you do that? It is just very natural for him to know. So the resources, the knowing where the stuff was and making sure that it was in working order. Yeah. Very much a self-preservational genius that others don't possess. Sometimes I think, and this goes a little bit into the next category of the the nesting, but the self-preservational people I know, you walk into their home and it's it tends to be a lot more organized. Yeah, for sure. Things have a place. There's a comfort to that environment because the tools were clean because that was a sense of security and that made things feel like I'm prepared for tomorrow. I know how to be prepared if I know where my tools are and I know that they're going to be clean and sharp and, you know, all of that is already taken care of. Yeah. And, you know, there's certain people that I know who because of levels of health and unhealth, yeah, that part of it, even though that is more of their instinctual energy, it's where their attention goes, mm. can overdo it and actually have mm. so much stuff and not know where the stuff is and be disorganized. <laughs> uh, and create a disorganized environment. That doesn't mean that they're not self-preservational. It just means that that could be pushed to an extreme and become a problem in their lives. But even those people, I would say, hey, do you have this? And they'd say, oh, yeah, I, I have it. I know where it is. It's located over there, and they'd find it. Because it's where the energy goes. The attention tends to go there. So, so let's talk about the nest, because you brought that up. Yeah. The home. Humans are the ultimate nesters of the animal kingdom already. Lots of species create nests, but we are the ones who basically reform the world to be our nest (laughs) Mm. in a lot of ways. And this comes from that self-preservational instinct of wanting to control the environment so that it suits the needs of of the species. And so for a a lot of self-preservational types, the nest, the home, you're going to find an attention towards, a draw towards an environment that is comfortable, that meets the needs, that has a stocked fridge, you know, all of those things is going to be something that they tune into and they're trying to create in order to have that security of the home environment. Yeah. And we know that these instincts are well known by advertisers. The whole oh, yeah. entire industry of marketing and advertising to people is to trigger one of our instincts. Mm-hmm. And because we all have self-preservation as an instinct within us, even if it's the neglected one, the one we don't pay attention to much, we may not be necessarily drawn into the marketing of a self-preservational right. kind of thing going on there. 
but many others are. And we're still going to have that eye to that. Like, oh, that's a good point. I probably should have this. I probably should have that. I probably should do this. And so it is remarkable how so much is aimed in that direction. Yeah, I think there's a product called like the Nest, isn't it? But yeah, home security is very much a self-preservational industry that targets that desire, that need. I, I've never thought about having a alarm on my house. I'm oh, like, my. I, if I lock the door, it's because it, <laughs> my wife's told me to do it. I mean, it's just so right. not the way my mind thinks. Yeah. yeah, but for a lot of people, they're tuned in. You know, we'll get into this in later episodes, but there can be, you know, type overlays or other other reasons. A type might do this. But for self-preservation, the point we're trying to make is they're tuned in to wanting to make sure that that home environment, the nest, is safe. Yeah. And I don't have a lot of it, but, like, I – have this office, and it's very much designed around what's important to me, that I have my own space to work in that's sort of separate from the noise. And I like having a soundproof room, not just because I'm a musician and wanted to do some music in here in a studio environment, but also because just on the average day, I like that. Mm. I like that I'm alone and that it's silent. Mm. And I can shut the door and it's really quiet in here. Mm. Even though we are in Lynn, Massachusetts, which <laughs> often has quite a bit of noise going on. But I like having an environment that feels that way. And all of us have those moments where we are kind of tuned into that energy. And we go, okay, I want to make sure that my environment is taken care of, my body is taken care of, my resources are taken care of. This is why, you know, people like Dave Ramsey have been able to sell, totally. you know, Financial Peace University. It's people waking up to that self-preservational instinct, I need to take care of my money. Yeah. This is why a lot of times people like me hit their 40s and went, I haven't been exercising enough and I'm going to like put a lot of energy into taking care of my body this year and eating better and exercising a lot more and doing a triathlon or whatever. A, a lot of times people who haven't utilized a particular instinct earlier in their life will get to a certain point and they'll be like, oh, I need to turn this switch on. Mm. And all my life, it's been, it seemed like the people around me, it was so easy for them to work out. It was so easy for them to eat right. Like, why is it so easy for them and so hard for me? Well, they might have been a little more tuned in to their self-pres instinct, either as their dominant or as their like secondary kind of neutral instinct. And this is something that has to be learned for others. Yeah. And so for a lot of people, this switch gets on, and this is when they really start paying attention to, like, getting out of debt, getting back into health, eating better, taking care of their bodies. And it can be a good health switch when that goes on. Oh, yeah. So I dated a girl years ago whose mom was very self-preservational. And so two things that I want to talk about is the nest and then also the ability for self-preservational people to see how others are doing in that self-preservational lens. Yeah. Or through that lens. And so they would see their world through that lens. So it's not only that you look at your own home that way, but you look mm, at the world that way. So every sure. time I walked in there, immediately she would look at me and go, you look tired. Did you sleep enough last night? <laughs> right. Are you gaining weight? Are you losing weight? You know, it was always around that issue yeah. of like everything around that. Joel, did you eat? You didn't eat, did you? I've got some lasagna here. You know, and it was always this kind of, mm. I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to take care of you from that self-preservational lens. And I also noticed that there was routines. So this is what drew me to self-preservational people was that they had routines in their home. They had order. They had a rhythm that they tended to follow a little bit more so. We'll talk about types and how it mixes with types and sometimes yeah. how that can be thrown off by the, uh, by the type. But generally the instinct of self-preservation is towards order and uh, right. routine and – because it creates a comfortable environment, right? Yeah. This is about comfort. It's about nesting. It's about making sure that there's well-being. So I've learned to appreciate, like you, I've learned yeah. to appreciate that and to welcome it. So I have a morning routine, yeah. and I like it. And I don't see myself ever shifting drastically from having morning routines because right. there is sort of a grounding to that. See and, the benefit, you know. yeah. And, yeah, you mentioned how it shows up in tight because there are some self-pres types that are more – the self-pres mechanism gets – more pointed at themselves and making sure they have enough. And there's those who are a little more outward, like some of the heart types where they are a little more outward focused and they are going to be tuned in to themselves. And they're also going to be tuned into like, how are you? And can I take care of exactly. you? Can I bring yeah. up where your self-pres needs to yeah. be? So that makes, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So let's talk about the sexual 
instinct. And again, yeah. when we do this in the corporate world, we call it the one-to-one -one instinct. And there are three categories under that as well. And the first one is the one that has to do with the risk, the ability to take risks. Yeah, so if we're talking evolutionary energy, that has to be the starting point because – the reason evolution has been possible is because you have to take risks. Yeah. You have to try and move forward, sometimes leading to the death of a species, but sometimes creating a, a stronger species. So it's trying to move forward. Mm. It's the evolutionary energy of forward movement, and forward movement requires some risk in order to make it happen. Yes, and this, again, is fascinating when we pair this up with types because there yeah. are types that tend to naturally be more oriented towards taking risks. Yep. And so if they have this as their dominant instinct, wow, that can be a little bit crazy. Uh, mm. But then you might be the type that your natural orientation to your type is not risk-taking. And now you have this instinct that is perhaps your dominant instinct and that shapes it differently as well. But yes, we needed risk in order to keep moving forward. So this, this risk and forward movement, it seeks to break rhythms or patterns or yeah. routines or habits. Right? Yes. So it does not like something to go on for too long. If there's a rhythm or a pattern or a habit that's gone on for a long time, let's, let's say an organization has been doing something a certain way for quite a yeah. bit of time. That creates comfort for self-preservational instinct and some for the social instinct, right. but it does not for the sexual instinct. The sexual right. instinct feels asphyxiated by that. It feels deprived. It feels held back. It feels like it does not have a contribution in that space nearly as much. Well, and there's a reason for that. So if you think about how, you know, animals grazing on the prairie and the food source starts to run out, the self-preservation will want to make sure that we have enough right here, right now. But it's that sexual energy that says, no, we actually have to risk crossing this desert over here of unknown lands with predators so that we can actually make it to another food source. So that energy is necessary. You have to break the boundaries out of what is comfortable and what is immediate because it may not actually be sustaining enough. The sexual energy knows that the immediate environment, as comfortable as it might be, isn't sustainable long term and there, that risk is needed in order to break through into new grounds, new industries, new feeding grounds, innovations yeah. require that sexual energy. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think about certain like the mad scientist, right? The one that has <laughs> zero social skills, yeah. zero like routines. The house is disordered. They're disheveled. Yeah. The only thing they think about is is solving the puzzle, you know, that's in front of them. Mm. That sexual energy really wants to solve the problems at a higher level, like take us to the new place where then things will be better, you know, um, that idea. So, so it pushes us there. Um, it's the energy that helps us break old habits, actually. Right. So a lot of times we can get stuck in habits. We can get stuck in routines, even if they aren't good for us. And this is the energy that actually can help us get out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you think about all the changes that are necessary in your life and the self-preservation sometimes resists that. Uh, the sexual pushes that forward. And I think when people think of what the sexual energy or the sexual subtype, I don't think they think as much about that, um, the push or the risk. I think they think more about the second category, which is that broadcasting and attraction category. Yeah. Yeah, so broadcasting attraction, I mean, you think, again, you think of the animal kingdom, this is mating season, this is where, this is now time to show off, show mm -hmm. your capacities, your strengths. Your, so people that tend to do this naturally are self-promoters. There's the ability to do that, to use charm, to use charisma. Seduction, attraction, Seduction. pull you in energy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're willing to leverage their sexuality, their gender, their appearance. And it's not, again, so let me just make sure we, we say this. Um, this is instinctual. This is not at a conscious level all the time, right. right? We're in our practice, and we'll talk about this more in later episodes, we want to learn how to call that up to the, yeah. to the attention, to the level of awareness. Yeah. But for the most part, it functions there. We're not aware that we're doing it. It's not like we're intentionally doing it, but it does happen. And we're leveraging charm, playfulness, yeah. uh, charisma, 
all of that to try to convince, to draw people to ourselves. So that's how that functions. Yeah, and just to be clear, I know a lot of people grew up in environments where there was a morality that was placed around this. And so if you were dominant in this instinct or had a high degree of this instinct in certain environments, it was actually seen as like a moral issue. But this is just part of who we are as people. And for some people, there is a harder time based on your environment owning this energy. But everything around you is aware of it. Like this is something that marketers really tap into because, you know, they know that sex sells. Well, what we're trying to point at in the instincts is uh, so does self-pres. Self-pres sells too. Mm -hmm. The news is dependent on it. The mm -hmm. social instinct sells too. And we'll get to that in a second. But I just want to clarify that we're not making any kind of like morality statements around this. Like the capacity to broadcast, to draw attention to yourself. Now, what you do with that attention once it comes towards you, that may not be as neutral. But instincts like a type, there's not a good or bad. There can be healthier or unhealthier expressions of every instinct and every type, of course. But I just wanted to pull it out of that world because I think some people hear that. And I've had the conversation with people when this was their lowest instinct. And they're like, well, the environment I grew up in, that was all kind of wrong or sin or, or whatever. And so it's like you kind of have to break away from that especially if this is an instinct that is not very present within you, you actually have to break away from the story that it's a morality thing in order to develop and have this be integrated into who you are. Mm -hmm. And we do place values around our instincts. You say this all the time, we moralize our type. We do. We also moralize our instinct. Absolutely. I am normal yep. and everyone else is a deviation of the normal. Yep. This is what I value. And so this over here is a deviation. So people who are extremely low in sexual instinct might look at people who are very high in it and think, well, they're kind of the uh, the shaming of, oh, yeah. of the people who are like that. People who are high in sexual instinct and might have, you know, they start sex positivity podcasts or whatever. They look at people who have it repressed and they're like, well, they're kind of prudish or behind the times. Both of those are actually versions of moralizing our type. 100%. <laughs> Even if you take that out of the sexual piece, you're thinking it's still through the sexual energy. Yeah. It's new ideas versus yeah, old ideas. New ideas, ideas right. Like progressive versus conservative. Yeah. There are certain mindsets that fit neatly within some of these categories. And again, we have them all. In the right. among progressives, sure. we have self-preservational types. Among conservatives, you have self You'll have self-preservational yeah. and sexual and social types. So we have them all in all of yeah. these groups. What we tend to do is to moralize our thinking and not realize that we are thinking the way we're thinking, primarily because of our type and our instinctual drive. Right, and that that starts real early in life. Yeah, for sure. And so then we have this last category, the immersion fusion. So this is where... It's still under the sexual. It's still under the sexual, yeah, and it yeah. gets a little bit... This part gets maybe a little bit fuzzy for those... It will be definitely fuzzy for those who, have, if you, who do not have this as your dominant instinct. But that is the ability to, to fuse, to almost... It's like a merging of two energies together, mm -hmm. of two people together. And there's this intimacy that takes place, this exchange that takes place, this oneness that happens. And people who love this oftentimes do focus in on one person. So if they show up yeah. at a party, if they go to at work, wherever they are, they tend to have this one person or they'll have multiple one-offs, but it's not right. group thinking yet. Even if they're like, oh, yeah, I had this great conversation with us. I had this other great conversation with this person. I, you know, we worked together on a project. And it was amazing. And we did this. And there's a lot of this sort of like it can happen with a bunch of different people. But the energy exchange is in the one-to-one -one as opposed to. And we'll look at this. This is definitely a good contrast to the social instinct, yeah. which tends to think more of the group. This brings it to the real one-on-one. -on -one. So this is where the conversation in the Enneagram world between those who want to use sexual instinct versus those who want to use the one-on-one, -on -one, this really gets at that, this connection, mm -hmm. this exchange. We work together. We had this great conversation. We went deep. Yeah. There was this really awesome exchange between us. And some of you may think, well, that that's more of like um, certain types, isn't it? No, this energy happens with all kinds of types. Yeah. That's that exchange that 
people seek who are that sexual yeah. one-to-one instinct. Yeah, that exchange of intense energy. Yeah, it's intense. Yeah. It is, yeah, it's an exchange of intense energy, and that can happen in romantically and in the sexual arena. But even the word sexual, it's a reference to connection. Yeah. I've talked to certain sexual subtypes about this, and they have often talked about, you know, having super intense friendships that last for an amount of time. And it's not even they're wrapped up in like a romantic partner, but they can be really wrapped up in a single friend. And have a really intense relationship with that one friend to the exclusion of some of their other relationships or some of the other people around them. And it's like all of a sudden we are these close, really close-knit people. And there can be an intensity to that. And also there can be sometimes explosion to that and then another intense friendship. Well, it's not committal. That's the right. thing, too, that, to keep in mind. This is not Sexual a committal thing. is not committed. No, yeah. it's not committed. It's not the same thing as self-preservation or social. Right. Where self-preservation may think of like, oh, yeah, we definitely need to settle down, have a family. It's very much about that. Um, social instinct, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the sexual energy is looking for the intense connection. Mm -hmm. It's really fiery. And it can miscommunicate to the other person that there's something more to that. Yeah. It's more, it's like we had a great time. It was we had we went deep. We had this wonderful right. exchange on this work project we did together. It was so much yeah. fun. Then that sexual energy may take its attention somewhere else. Yeah, because it isn't necessarily perceived to need to be long term. There isn't a necessity for it to be a sustainable thing, just a, the intensity of it is a little bit more appealing. And a lot of movies actually play on this need. Totally. When you talk about the need for that intensity of relationship, whether it's certain dramas or romance movies, whatever they are, and even a lot of action films that are a lot more about like someone taking on and fighting the world, a lot of the sexual energy in all three of these categories is sort of pitched in the world of media. So a lot of songs are based on these type of energies, you know, the pushing boundaries. I'm going to, you can hear me roar and I'm going to take mm. on the world. You know, it's the broadcasting and energy. Like, look at me, look how attractive I am. Look at my music video. And that immersion fusion is a ton in movies. So you're saying that like you couldn't have a great movie that's all self-preservation. <laughs> Is that Castaway? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think. It was like some one person trying to survive on a desert right, island. Right, right, right. Like, yes, that, I think that tunes into a little more of that self-pres. But most movies are a little bit more in this, in this arena. Yeah, it, it makes so much sense. Music, yeah. movies, books, romantic, not, I mean, sci-fi. I mean, all these categories. It, it's so true. It draws on that sizzle, that excitement. Yeah. Right? yeah. Visually, emotionally sexually, intensity as far as energetic and action. Yeah. I mean, I think of a show like Game of Thrones, which is just oh my. pure yeah. <laughs> sexual energy. The Whether it's the violence in it or any of it, it's just – it's trying to tap into that elemental part of us mm. that evolved to need to take risks. And since a lot of us don't have it in our day-to-day -day lives, typically – we couldn't afford to live a life where we actually had to walk around with a sword on our side. And most of us don't want to actually live in that world, but we still want to be tapped into that energy of ourselves. And a lot of times media is an outlet for those things that are not a daily part of our life anymore, that mm. kind of risk. So, yeah. yeah. So this is great because what we're realizing as – well, I'm realizing more and more as we're talking is – all three are everywhere around us yeah. and will appeal to all of us at different mm -hmm. levels. And still we will see things through the self-preservational instinct if we're self-preservational dominant. Yep. And we'll look for those components. So even in the sense of like taking risks, self-preservational types will look at it and understand the need to take risk based upon the need for self-preservation. Yeah. And we'll look at that in terms of growth because that's how you can sort of hack that is to begin to understand if you want the sexual exchange that you right. have, this intensity, this like real one-to-one -one connection, sometimes you're going to have to pull a little bit more of the self-preservational instinct in or the social instinct in to ensure that that continues to happen for you. So Yeah, so let's talk about the social instinct. Yeah. Reading and interpreting. So social instinct, the first category under that is the ability to read body language and facial expressions and energies all in order to care for the group. 
this is about the group. This is important to make a distinction because for sexual types, this seems like, oh, yeah, I do that. I do this. Or uh, self-preservation, oh, yeah, I do. I do some of that. But the idea here is it isn't about preserving the self, preserving anyone, or about this deep exchange or connection mm -hmm. or risk-taking. It's about the care for the group so the group itself does well. It survives. And yeah, and when you think about how this came on in the animal kingdom, you're talking the pack. You're talking the herd. How do we take care of each other? You know, how do the adults form the herd's movements around the younger ones so that they're protected from the predators that want to pick them off? Mm. So there's this – it's an energy that is tuned into – those around me, how do I pay attention to my environment to make sure that the we before the me is okay? This is the perpetuation of the species and not just my genes. This has an adaptation to it then as well because then it means that your focus is primarily on how are we doing and therefore I can adapt some of myself mm -hmm. for the sake of the, of the group. Yeah, so it can soften some of the more dominant types, for instance. We know that from countertypes, but which we'll get into later. But the basic introduction of that, it, it does. It's much more about how do I make sure that we are doing okay. And for the social type, if they're in a room full of, you know, a few people or they're in a conversation with a couple others, they're not just paying attention to how they're showing up that. They want to make sure that the dynamic between the other parties involved are okay. There's a sort of a tuning into the complex network, which is why this comes on evolutionary third. So the self, then the progression of the sexual and that forward movement energy. And the most complex species are herd species. So the ones who work in herds, whether you're talking dolphins or elephants, there's a higher level of cognitive capacity that is necessary in that species. And humans are one of the most social creatures of all. So even those who aren't dominant in this, like there is this capacity to read and interpret. And so that being the first thing, language, the development of humans using language is so much wired into this social contract, this social capacity. We need to be able to use language and read nonverbals. The nonverbals turned on earlier because other animals in yep. the animal kingdom do that. So we have that within us. And reading the energy comes in earlier on. Self-pres do that. Reading the energy as the safe. Sexual does that to tune into mating or war. Mm -hmm. Who do I need to fight in order to who do I need to mate with? That's an energy kind of a thing that animals have too. But then we've turned on this other higher level, which is interaction of now I can read energy, I can read body language, and I can actually communicate more complicated relational things because I'm deeply in tuned to the we and the us and the social structure of these much larger groups, even to create something as absurd as a city, you know, mm, every yep. other species can run in these small groups, but humans have created entire cities where you, you do what no one else in the animal kingdom does, which is you hang out around strangers. Yeah. This is where you see so much of this energy in politics, mm. in fields of anthropology, yes. sociology, you know, yeah. there is a whole industry around this as yeah. well, where people think in terms of those larger conceptual frameworks. And so you'll find social instinct dominant types to be a little bit more conceptual, yeah. whereas you'll find self-preservational more practical or concrete, yep. right? We're speaking again in generalities. Yes. So there are people that are in the social fields who are very practical, and there are people mm -hmm. who are self-preservational who can go right up to conceptual as well. So, But in general, that's where it tends to go is in those areas. Yeah, because there's the necessity for both the concrete and the paradox within the social instinct. Because if you're reading language, facial expressions, energy, body language, that requires a lot of complexity um, when you're trying to, you know, to care for the herd. And it's reading the intentions. So one thing that social types are very much in tune to is what are the intentions of this person? As in, are there ways that they're trying to like manipulate the system? And is the thing that they're doing good for the whole? So reading intentions of individuals, of social structures, of like whole networks of relationship is something that the attention always goes toward. Yeah, and it's also for they want to know in what way can we make this work? If I know your intentions, I know your agenda mm – -hmm. 
let's see how we can leverage all of this. So it's again, it's a very, very sophisticated way of thinking, yeah. willing to adapt. It's not so looking for its own immediate needs being met as much right. as how are we, how can we create this? So it looks at teams, it looks at groups and structures and organizations and how do we create something? so that your agendas, your intentions, you know, are being met. So a lot of these social leaders will kind of look around, check with the individuals, keep tabs, trying to understand what's happening here, what do you need, and then how can we make this work? Yeah. And so then they get into that sort of practical mode of how do we make this work? How do we fit you in here so that you get your needs met? And so, But for the sake of the group, and again, for the goal of this group survival, the group's thriving, and so that tends to be where their mind goes, mm. which brings us to the next part of the bonding and affiliating, mm. which is the next category here. This is this sort of touch point. Like, I want to make sure that I'm, how are you doing? What's happening? This yep. sort of checking in to maintain the bonds. Different from, say, fusing as with the sexual energy, which is going yeah. deep. This is more about how are we doing? Are we getting along? And are things okay? Yeah. And then let's see if we can move forward to make sure that that continues to be that way. And making sure you have your allies, your partners, your people that are – so we're, this is, again, about the group. Like, are right. we together? Are we? Do we have our allies? Are we yeah. – uh, yeah. That's a great point because one thing that the social instinct dominance types tend to do very well is be able to spot allies. They can kind hmm. of tell where the allies and the enemies are. Hmm. Where are the defenders and where are the predators? Where are the people who will strengthen the herd and how do I make sure that this thing over here doesn't disrupt or ruin the energy of that? Because they are tuned into that, the us. It's very much on group partnership, co-creation. Mm -hmm. We have to co-create this existence. And so that requires this dance. And so when yeah. you're you're going to be in this dance, you're going to be picking up on that bonding, that affiliating, you know, is this someone who I can be affiliated with mm -hmm. energy, uh, whether they're creating a corporate culture or they just want to make sure in spotting a partner, is this someone who can actually adjust and move along with life or is this someone who's going to be like – fire passionate and then yeah. fan out or are they going to be someone who pulls away because they need to make sure they take care of themselves it's making sure that like i can pick someone and i can i know that it's going to be a safe person to co-create some existence with. yeah and this is the blind spot then for the social types it's just important to say that just because there's an awareness of how people fit in allies and group yeah. and how to, the us works, this is not about a goal. This right. is not about we're trying to achieve this thing here, right. which can sound like that's what's going on here, but that's yeah. not what's happening. It's more about, again, how are we <laughs> doing? And so the blind spot can be in the area of, yeah, but there's a goal to achieve. There's a purpose that we're gathering together as a team. But that's how the, the social structure or the social instinct tends to think. Yeah. When you talk about social types, they're very much curious about other people. They're always mm. kind of spotting who's in the room, who would I want to meet, who would I want to talk to, very tuned into that. And when they meet someone, they do want to kind of understand, like, where is this person coming from? Where are they going? What's motivating them? What's driving them? So there is a natural curiosity in, in meeting new people. They want to do that because it this could be someone who could – make my herd stronger and more oh, yeah. capable of able making Well, through. that brings us to the third, which is the contribution to others. Yeah, it's Like big. we, you know, what is the contribution? And again, this is, the contribution is for the sake of the group. And so, you know, who are you and what can you contribute? And what is my contribution? By the way, I think I forgot to mention too, that in terms of this, it tends to think in terms of hierarchy as well, uh, social structures, even if it's a non-hierarchical mm -hmm. type, or a person that has developed to a place of seeing the world more as not so much of a top-down right. structure of power, but more of like what are our unique contributions. It still looks at who are you, what's your role, from a practical standpoint of in what way do I then work alongside of you or you know work for you or – so again, it's very contributory in its way of thinking. Like, what do I? What's my contribution here? What part of it do you need? What part of it will help? And what are you contributing 
to the whole as well. Yeah, it's a growth hierarchy, not a dominance hierarchy. Mm. That's how I would make that distinction. So a dominance hierarchy is more competitive. Mm -hmm. A growth hierarchy can be more Mm skill-led as opposed to, you know, who's the person in charge? It's like, well, who's the person in charge of this? As the social dynamic grows in the world and we integrate all three of these energies, you start to see more of these like matrix style leadership organizations and in groups where it can really function around, well, who's leading this thing as opposed to like everything has to go through the competitive leader who has made their way to the top. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it tends to think a little bit more flat and it tends to think more like a growth hierarchy, like what's going to help us grow and who in the group can help us advance in that way. And it's not the dominance hierarchy of this is the person in charge. And I would say that that has to do also with levels of, of awareness and consciousness. And I think oh, growth, totally. right? Yeah. Because I think some people who maybe have a more traditional model that they grew up with, which is very hierarchical, very much top-down power yeah. structure, if they have a social instinct, they're going to see it as, well, if you're in charge, then that's you're in charge. Or if I'm in charge, I'm in right. charge and you do what I say. But through development, through growth, through greater awarenesses, there are other models and there are other ways yeah. of leading than through power. Yeah, I mean, y'all can go back and check out some of the spiral dynamic stuff because yeah. there is a difference between <laughs> like a social blue who is my group versus your group, yeah. the survival of my group versus your group versus someone who's, you know, in more like green, which is every group can kind of coexist together. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, you can just skip it and move on. But it does show up very different. So yeah, there's this desire to have a, a contribution. This is also where altruism turns on, where it wants to take care of each other, wants to take care of others. And it is ultimately, like you said, it's not goal-based, but it is mission-based. It wants to be, it wants ultimately everyone to kind of be okay. Mm. It wants something for the greater good. Because if you think about it, that still means that I'm safe and it still means that I can freely mate and connect Mm -hmm. and create new things. So it it includes that. But where the social instinct can kind of overdo it or do wrong is it can actually lose sight of its capacity to take risks because it's thinking about everyone right here. It can lose sight of its self-preservational instinct because it's so much concerned bonding and affiliating with the person next door that it didn't go and make food that would actually help it survive. So right. um, it yeah. can kind of this is we'll get into this, but it if they're not um brought into balance over time, and we mentioned before, one of those will come more into the awareness that has been missing for a long time as people get older and we we look at that. One thing I wanted to mention is the feel of these types that we forgot to mention, because I think it's I think it's a helpful image where we talk about how would you say? So The feel for self-pres and the sexual and the social, the way I see it anyways, and there will be different opinions around this, is self-pres is warm, sexual is hot, and social is cool. Self-pres is warm because it creates the nest. It wants to create a warm environment that is a place of of comfort, of home, Mm. of safety, You think of the the fireplace, the smells in the kitchen and all that. It's just like everything feels so nice and so warm. And then you have the sexual instinct, which tends to be very fiery, very hot, very much a uh, sizzle energy. And then you'll see the social, which because it's so cerebral, because it tends more towards the, the bigger, larger social frameworks and not as interested in creating a warm, comfortable environment or a fiery exchange or taking on something new, it tends to cool things down a little bit because its affect even is less about the depth of connection you and I had and more about the sort of how are we doing and are we able to work well together? Do you have what you need? Do I have what I need? That can feel nice and sometimes warm, yeah. but oftentimes it'll be the affect of the of the social instinct, the person with it, will tend to be a little bit more cooler and more thoughtful and more cerebral. So I think of it in those terms, and you know, you think again if the Christmas that card that you get with the family and everybody's mm-hmm. dressed yeah. and there's a fireplace and it's warm <laughs> and it's so cozy, you think self pres. Yeah. You think of like a romantic movie where there's just like, 
you know, explosion of energy and of excitement yeah. and of sizzle. And then the social, you think in terms of, you know, politics, social scientists, and that kind of energy to it. And it's an appeal to the social where we're like, it's cool, man. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and again, people will have different ways of seeing it out there. This isn't like critical or super important to, right. to hold, but it's just been my experience of the instincts. And I didn't come up with this. I call it mine, but I didn't come up with this. This is uh, taken from my school that I mm. got my certification through. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then as I ran into it, it kind of seemed true for a lot of people mm -hmm. that I met. But this is not universal because there are types that because their type is warm, even if they're a social type, will feel warm to you. Yeah. Um, if you imagine a type two who's a social two, they might have a bit more warmth to them than, say, a social eight would. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. So this is our introduction to instincts, just to get our feet wet for the year and some of the stuff that we hope to do this year. Or we're really excited about to dive into this because uh, one thing we've been talking about is there's more and more people in the Enneagram world who are thinking maybe you should actually start with instincts instead of type. Mm. So we're not having an opinion on that or landing in that or coming out with that, uh, saying anything about that right now. We just want to say we want to lean into this space a little bit more so that you all have more information, that you can lean into it more. And hopefully, ultimately, it's always toward our growth.